uh, will be uh, David Craigan sitting over there, and Faith Flam, where are you, Faith? Ah, Faith Flam, science uh, commentator and writer sitting over there. So that will be Monday in this room. Then February, we have uh, Professor Alan Mann of Princeton University talking about another controversial topic, the evolution of human beings and what it means to be human. Then finally, in March, we'll have uh, Professor Brian Regal, who wrote a book on Darwin and Sasquatch, talking about evolution and cryptozoology and some of his hunts for mon monsters. Then in April, we'll be participating in the Philadelphia Science Festival. I'm hoping to line up Mike Shermer, but all that will be in our newsletter and our email list. Uh, are there any other announcements I might have missed? No? In that case, uh, for today, the topic is uh, the beautiful simplicity of the cosmos. And to people that say that science and mathematics is too cold, I always encourage people, whether you uh, believe in a deity or not, there's something almost magical at nighttime, looking up, maybe not necessarily every night in the city, at the stars and contemplating the stars. And when I was young, the, uh, the song went, uh, Twinkle, twinkle, little star, uh, star, how I wonder what you are. And I feel privileged to, at this point, be able to know, uh, yes, it's uh, hydrogen, uh, meeting other hydrogen atoms, turning into lithium and giving off uh, energy, and that's what sustains life. And to me, that's a really neat thing. And it's a high calling in science to try to figure out what are we all made of, what's down to the tiniest pieces of everything, and the biggest pieces of, it, of everything. To me, that's uh, the closest thing to magic out there, and there's still plenty of questions left to be answered. And somebody who is our speaker today is on the cutting edge of this. Uh, he is uh, Dr. David Goldberg, who's professor of physics from Drexel University, and he is our speaker today. So please join me in giving him a, a warm hand to talk to us about why symmetry matters. Live mic, yes? Yeah. That would be great. Uh, so first of all, it's, it's wonderful to see uh, to see so many people uh, out here today. Um, I gave a talk to this group, I think three years almost exactly, uh, on cosmology and crackpots, uh, which was a um, it was, it was more of a negative talk in the sense that there was a, there was a debunking element going on, uh, whereas my focus today is, is far more positive. Um, I, I'm, I'm focusing on not so much why people are wrong about this or that, but why the universe, as complicated as it appears, is governed by some incredibly, uh, incredibly simple physical laws um, and, and really, really simple fundamental uh, foundations, foundational ideas. And that foundational idea is symmetry. Um, this, not surprisingly, forms the basis of, of my new book that came out this summer uh, called The Universe in the Rearview Mirror. I have a few copies for sale uh, for, for $25, not if you brought a copy, I'm also obviously happy to sign it as well uh, after the talk. Um, I, and before I forget, because I almost always forget in a talk like this to, to give proper acknowledgement, there's some very, very cool figures in, these, in this uh, in the book and in, in the talk that were done by a fellow by the name of Herb Thornby, and he just, he just captured the style perfectly, so I want to make sure I give him due credit uh, before we get started. So uh, I begin with a quote by the Nobel laureate Phil Anderson, who says, it's only slightly overstating the case to say that the study of physics is the study of symmetry. This is an old idea. In fact, we're going to see how old the idea that symmetry is sort of the foundation of physical law is. Answer, thousands of years. But it turns out that it wasn't until relatively recently that we had any real idea of how it was that symmetry and physics really fit together. I should begin, I should begin, with a definition. You know, the, the, uh, the standard boring approach would be Merriam-Webster's dictionary defines symmetry as. Uh, but we'll begin instead with a mathematics uh, definition. So Herman Weil, the great mathematician, said, a thing is symmetric if there's something you can do to it so that after you've done uh, done doing it, it looks the same as it did before. 
So, you know, the obvious case is you take a circle. I could take a circle and I could rotate it this way and that way, and it still looks like the same circle. Even better, I can take a sphere. And, of course, I can rotate a sphere in, 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 in three dimensions, and it appears the same as it did before. Now, the spheres in particular are so obviously symmetric that if you were looking for a beautiful description of the universe, you would latch onto a sphere almost immediately, which is exactly what the ancients did, right? We had this idea of the celestial sphere on which the stars were supposed to be glued, and then there were the individual spheres that contained the, the, the planets, and of course we were at the center because there was an overall spherical symmetry to the universe. Beautifully symmetric, nice idea, clearly not borne out by actual reality. But there's the kernel of truth there, and we'll see how that plays in later on. But first, we'll start a little bit simpler. We'll start with triangles. So triangles, triangles have a, a somewhat simpler symmetry than the sphere. You can't do anything to them keep them the same, but you can do some certain things. I can rotate them 120 degrees. I can rotate them 120 degrees again. Or rotate them the other way. Or Flip them in a mirror. And that's basically it. There's a finite set of things that I can do to them, and then they look the same as they did before. They've got some symmetry, not complete symmetry. But symmetry is beautiful in many, many ways. It shows up, um, it shows up in uh, architecture. It shows up in art. It shows up in all sorts of intellectual endeavors. I, myself, am a fan of crossword puzzles. And you know, there's a rule for American-style crossword puzzles that says that the black squares have to be done in such a pattern such that if you turn the entire puzzle around 180 degrees, or the other possibility is if you look at the thing in the mirror, the black square patterns make the same. Now, there's no fundamental reason why that should be the case. It's just pleasing to our minds. Nature also seems to really like the idea of symmetry. Flowers, uh, galaxies, this is, uh, I believe, ME1, Beautiful spiral galaxies. Clearly, I could take it, rotate it around half a turn. It would look basically the same as it did before. There's something about the laws of nature that just give rise to symmetries over and over and over again. I know that there are some life science people here, some people who deal with the squishier things in life. This is sort of a cartoon version of the uh, the double helix DNA, uh, first imaged by Rosalind Franklin, and for which uh, Watson and Crick received the Nobel Prize. Double helix of DNA gives is the structure that ultimately gives rise to our genetic inheritance uh, and forms the basis of, of life. It is clearly symmetric in many, many ways. I can take the structure, I can twist it, and the structure looks the same as it did before. But it's not symmetric in every way. For example, it clearly, it, it clearly spins in a particular direction, such as, such that, for example, if, if you're facing, it's facing you, the strands appear to be going counterclockwise as they face you. If I took this double helix and I looked at it in a mirror and it had the opposite sense of rotation, you would be able to tell, or a biologist would be able to tell at an instant that this, was a, this had non-terrestrial origin. It is, in fact, a testament to the common origin of all life on Earth, that all DNA spirals the same way. And yet there's nothing, there's nothing in the physical makeup of the universe that makes that happen. It's chance, and it's a symmetry breaking that has been propagated forward, and because once it was broken, it stayed broken. Theirs is true, by the way, there's sugars as well that have a particular orientation, and you, know, you, can, you can feed them to bacteria, and they'll eat them up just fine. You take a chemically identical sugar that, that is uh, twisted basically in the opposite direction, and the bacteria will go hungry. We are, only, we are only evolved to eat one preferred direction, basically. We are going to find that this is going to be a very, very general theme as to how the universe works. This idea that the universe as a whole has these wonderfully symmetric laws, and yet, there were symmetry breakings, very, very small things in some cases, one part in a billion. And those tiny little breaks in the symmetry caused enormous, enormous implications. Hint, you. We will see that if you take the laws of physics at face value, at a symmetry, at face value, and say that this symmetry is perfect, that you will find all sorts of impediments to your existence. It's only by symmetry breaking 
that we are able to get things like the dominance of matter over antimatter in the universe. And we'll get to that in a moment. So, a little bit of a, a little bit of an introduction of, of what, should, what we should be thinking about when we talk about symmetric object. So, in a group like this, you may have some visceral associations with these shapes. <laughs> exactly. Um, we know them as platonic solids, but they, uh, they of course are also used in a popular brand name role-playing game. Uh, just out of curiosity, anyone know which one's missing? Just by sight? The ten-sided ten dice, the D10. That is because the D10 is not one of the platonic solids, not one of the figures that has every face identical to one another. You'll have noticed that it has little, little, um, little discontinuities, basically, that have to be sort of filled in by hand. It, it, is, a, it is a figure known as an anti-dye pyramid. And actually, the D10 has a special name. It's called uh, Bimbo's Lozenge. I would a mathematician a friend inform me. I think it do So we've got the five platonic solids, and then of course you've got sort of the, the uber platonic solid, which is the sphere, right? The sphere is essentially, you can imagine that as the infinitely sided dice. Six platonic solids, which brings us to sort of introducing uh, the idea of the idea of the platonic solids, the, the idea of symmetry into the modern epoch. So if you were an ancient and did not have access to a telescope, you'd look at these five platonic solids plus the sphere, and you'd say, oh, that's six total. What do you know? There are six planets total. Even if, even, if you, even if you recognize that the sun is at the center, even if we recognize that we live in a heliocentric universe, which many of the ancients did, by the way, you say six planets, six platonic solids. I'm a believer in, in the beauty of symmetry. Perhaps there's some relation between the two of them. So, very famously, of course, Johannes Kepler in 1610-ish, in uh, came up with his model of the universe, this model of the planets as they moved around the sun. This ain't it. This is not the one that he's famous for. This is known as the uh, Mysterium Cosmographicum, and Kepler's idea with this was the laws of physics must be symmetric, uh, clearly, the ancients had it wrong. These celestial spheres that they came up with were a lot of bunk. But perhaps there's something like this. If I can embed all of the orbits of the planet in some sort of cosmological turducken, maybe we can make all the orbits match. And basically, if you, if you work out the permutations with six, uh, six different shapes to embed it within one another, you've got 120 different combinations. So we kept mixing and matching until he had something that looked just about right. But we know it's wrong. And you know, the, the, the funny thing about it is, I mean, Kepler, you know, Kepler is, is quite widely held in esteem, and rightly held in esteem, because he did describe how the planets moved. He described the planets moving as ellipses. And the funny thing about it was, the reason Kepler was forced to come up with crazy stuff like this was that he figured that if it was really the case that planets went around in ellipses, surely somebody else would have come up with it already. That was just such an incredibly simple pattern. He did, of course, eventually recognize that all the planets moved around in the ellipses, and these became known as Kepler's laws of motion. Planets travel in ellipses with the sun at one focus, and so on. Now, an ellipse is a relatively symmetric shape. I mean, we know, we know what it looks like. It's a squash sort of circle. It's not as symmetric as a circle, but it has some symmetries. It fell to, to, uh, to Isaac Newton to really explain what the symmetry was. You see, we live in a three-dimensional universe. And even for those of you who get excited about reading about things like string theory, there might be smaller dimensions out there. But the big dimensions, there are three of them. And as a result, as a result of that, plus a very simple symmetry principle, which is that gravity works the same in all directions, the idea is, if you look further and further and further away from a gravitational source, the gravity drops off. If I take a sphere, which is to say the gravity diffused equally all over all parts of the sphere, and double the radius of the sphere, that sphere will be four times the surface area, and gravity is one-fourth as strong. This is known as an inverse square law. And by the way, if we lived in a, if we lived in a four-dimensional universe, we'd have an inverse cube law of gravity. If we lived in a uh, five-dimensional universe, we live in an inverse fourth law, and so on. 
It's a good thing we don't, by the way. Um, I, hate to, I hate to bring, especially with an audience like this, because I think it's just inviting, it's inviting tough questions during the questioning period, but, you know, it is, it is a good thing that we don't live in a four-dimensional universe or higher, because you can show very simply that if we did happen to live in a four-dimensional universe, then planets would not have any stable orbits whatsoever. They'd either spiral inwards or they'd spiral outwards. We'd freeze to death or we'd burn to death. And, and it, by the way, it's even true that atoms wouldn't even be stable. That's for any dimensionality higher than three. So it's good that we live in a three-dimensional universe. One might even say it's anthropically required that we live in a three-dimensional universe. So this is, this is me sort of like, you know, challenging you to, to ask me really tough questions at the end. I'm sort of asking for it at this point. But what, but what Newton did is, is incredible. He connected the dots. Because what he said is, look, if we start off with the assumption that gravity works the same in all directions, the most natural thing in the world is for us to have an inverse square law. So we start with a symmetry, we come to the physical law, and then what made Newton Newton, one of the many things that made Newton Newton, we've all heard his name even if we are not physicists, is Newton discovered uh, how gravity works, and in particular he discovered the orbits, of, he derived the orbits of planets from the inverse square law, and he showed that start with the inverse square law, you get elliptical orbits. That's what Newton proved. We start with a symmetry in the law itself, and we get something that looks somewhat asymmetric. That's what was so remarkable. And it turns out that this is just a general theme of how the universe works. So there are certain things where I can switch everything up, and the laws of physics will not care. For example, you know, we cared in general about the passage of time. We care that, you know, I start, the, I start this talk at whenever, and I finish 45 minutes later. I could have scared you and said, you know, and I finished three hours later. <laughs> we care about the difference between the beginning and end. We do not, for example, there's nothing, there's nothing in figuring out how much time to allot me that says, oh, well, in fact, it, it's very, very important that we know that the universe began 13.8 blah, 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 blah years ago that goes into this calculation. Or when you're, when you're doing a, any sort of physics experiment, the absolute age of the universe does not matter. All that ever matters are differences in times. Another way of saying that is the laws of physics seem to be the same at all times. They seem to be the same in all places. They seem to be the same in all directions. There is no absolute North Pole in the universe. The only reason there's a North Pole here on Earth is because of local effects. We could tilt the entire universe by 30 degrees, we would never know. And that seems to be true in absolutely every physical observation, every physical law we've ever seen. I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a um, sort of a, a quick example. One that's quite surprising. So uh, about the uh, about the clock of the universe. So we are, of course, able to do nuclear physics experiments now. Uh, one of the one of the main um, one of the main ingredients in nuclear fission is an isotope of uranium, uranium-235, which today is a relatively rare isotope. But it decays. I mean, uh, uranium-235 and the other main type, uranium-238, decay. Uranium-235 decays faster, which means that if you had a bunch of uranium in the past, the fraction of uranium-235 would have been higher in the past. In fact, it would have been higher enough, oh, a few billion years ago, that it was entirely possible, if you had a large concentration of uranium, to get spontaneous fission, which is exactly what happened in a site that was discovered in, uh, in Gabon. The, it was called the Oklo site. So you had this, this nuclear reactor, natural nuclear reactor, that lasted for millions of years, where we are able to actually see the residue, all the materials that were created from these nuclear reactions, and as far as we're concerned, the, the, act, the nuclear processes behaved exactly the same as if they happened <clears throat> yesterday. The laws of physics seem not to care one whit about when in the universe, or where in the universe, or which direction in the universe we're talking about. On the other hand, there are things that do matter. So for example, physical scale. 
you know, when you, when you, get, when you get speculative about, uh, when I say speculative, I mean I know that some of you are college students, which means that some of you have late night dorm discussions which may or may not be fueled